guys, it's Sarah here. In this video, I'm going to be going over a comprehensive NCLEX review in an hour. I just want to mention that this is not for somebody who's just starting out and needs to learn everything first. This is for someone who already is almost taking their NCLEX, already reviewed everything, and they just want a quick comprehensive review. So let's get started. I'm going to share the screen. I just want to let you know, um, I put it all like in a Word document. I do have the Word document. You could access it below. So we're going to be starting off going through med search. PI, diabetes and sepidus, means that you're peeing more because you have a low amount of ADH. And SIADH, you have too much. So you're holding it in too much. So you'll have symptoms according to that, meaning someone just peeing a lot. The treatment for someone who has DI would be desmopressin, and for SIADH would be fluid restriction, salt tablets, Next, we go on to dehydration. I'm sure we all know what that is. That is basically when you don't take enough fluid in. So the treatment for that would be oral rehydration. Some signs that someone would be dehydrated, dry mucous membranes, very um, chapped lips, tachycardic. They could be weak. If you pour skin turgor, so if you pinch your skin, it takes a while to go down, more than three seconds. Dehydration, you want to watch out for fluid and electrolyte imbalance. So diarrhea, as we all know, can be caused by many different stuff, laxative abuse, medication, viruses, etc. So what you want to do is you want to rest, encourage fluids. One thing you want to watch out for with diarrhea is um, electrolyte, dehydration, etc. Because a lot's coming out, but not much is going in. The opposite of dehydration would be water intoxication. That means you're taking in too much water. And the problem with this is that if you take in too much water, then you're drowning out all the salt. So they'll have hyponatremia. And they'll have symptoms of hyponatremia, like irritability, confused, seizures. Third spacing is when the fluid ship shifts from the blood to the tissues, and it can't be used there. So they have the fluid, it's just in the wrong place, and it can't be used. So they'll have symptoms of hypotension. It's common after abdominal surgery. Here are electrolytes that you have to know. So we'll go through this really quickly because there's not much really under, there's not much really to understand. You just have to kind of memorize it. Hyponatremia is low sodium. They'll have symptoms of lethargic seizures. Hypernitremia is the opposite to much sodium. They'll have restlessness. They also have seizures, increased thirst because they have too much sodium. So they need water to balance it out. Hypoglycemia is a low blood sugar, a loss of consciousness. They'll be confused a lot of times. Um, hyperglycemia too much blood sugar, they'll have excessive thirst, excessive urination, headache, blurry vision. Hypercalcemia, high calcium could cause constipation, low calcium could cause Trousseau and Chovex signs. Other electrolyte abnormalities, hypokalemia, you should know, kalemia is potassium, so a low potassium would do EKG changes like flat T waves, um, cardiac arrhythmias, hyperkalemia, too much potassium could also cause cardiac arrhythmias. When we go into burns, with burns and in general, it's always ABC, airway, breathing, circulation. Always, That's always going to be your first assessment. You're going to look at the airway, breathing, circulation. After that, with burns, you want to give them a lot of fluids, pain medication, and infection control, especially because it's open. If it's open, then it's at risk for infection. With burns, you do want to watch out for shock because fluid is going out, but not much is going in, which is why we give them fluid. Here are some stuff pertaining to cardiac. So the DASH diet would be for hypertension to reduce the sodium, more fruits, everything that you would think of in a good diet, low-fat diet, low-fat dairy if you're going to eat meat, lean meat. Rheumatic fever is an acute heart inflammation. It usually occurs after a strep infection. Ultra monitor is what we use to monitor EKG. Um, it's a continuous EKG monitoring, basically. Heart failure, when it comes to heart failure, they like to ask the right or the left symptoms. So the right side is going to be systemic symptoms, and the left side is going to be pulmonary symptoms. Because if you know your heart, the way it goes, you're going to have the pulmonary symptoms from your left. Treatment for that would be diuretics. you got to get out the fluid. You want to monitor them, oxygen, you want to avoid high sodium foods because that could lead to heart failure also, or an, it could cause an exacerbation. We have exercise stress tests and nuclear stress tests. Nuclear stress tests would be using um, vasodilators and dye to assess the coronary arteries. You want to 
dissection is a tear in the aorta and it's obviously an emergency because all the blood is going through aorta so that could cause internal bleeding and also it's not going to the right place so that is obviously a medical emergency aortic stenosis stenosis is the narrowing of the of the valve and that we're going to talk about a little bit later also mitral valve prolapse it's when the blood is kind of leaking through the valve um, a pacemaker is what we give to control the heart rhythm in someone with really low heart rate. ICD is an implantable device that monitors and defibrillates um, a life-threatening arrhythmia. In terms of when we defibrillate, we defib for VFib and pulseless VTAC. So defib, VFib, they rhyme, and also pulseless VTAC. If they have a pulse and they're in VTAC, you do not want to defib. An MI, a myocardial infarction or ischemia, is basically um, ischemia as reduced blood flow to the heart muscle and infarction would be an actual blockage so there is no blood getting to the heart muscle. Um, angina is chest pain due to that, due to the blockage of the blood flow. And we give nitro and we obviously figure out the cause, is there a blockage on treat, et cetera. Pericarditis, itis, anytime you see itis, you want to think of inflammation. Pericarditis is inflammation of the pericardium. This you want to treat with NSAIDs. NSAIDs are anti-inflammatories, so that would make sense for that. Ineffective endocarditis is infection of the heart's endothelial lining. If it's an infection, we treat it with antibiotics. If someone is in respiratory distress, so you obviously want to give them oxygen. You want to pay, place them in high Fowler's position. You want a suction if that's the reason why they can't breathe because the secretions are blocking. You always want to assess for lung sounds. You always want to notify the doctor. The sound, the lung sound of strider is a high-pitched sound that you hear during inspiration, and it basically indicates partial airway obstruction. It's kind of common in kids when they get viruses. A lot of times, especially croup, they'll go into strider. Incentive spirometer is a post-op tool used to prevent atelectasis which is collapsing. Um, so if someone has a rift fracture, you don't want it to collapse. You want to help to rebuild it and you want to give them a sense spirometer. You want to give them pain medication before. They should perform around five to 10 breaths per session hourly while they're awake. They should sit up and inhale deeply for two seconds, exhale slowly and repeat. Then we go on to COPD. COPD stands for chronic obstruction pulmonary disease that includes emphysema and chronic bronchitis. One of the main risk factors are tobacco smoking, not, not you know, cigarette smoking, not necessarily do they have to be the smoker, it could have been secondhand smoking. It could also be from occupational exposure like car mechanics, um, pollution, et cetera. Treatment for that is generally inhalers, nebulizers, and steroids. You want to avoid excessive oxygen as COPD patients rely on low oxygen levels for breathing, so they don't need to be setting oxygen saturation 98, they can be perfectly fine at a lower one. Obviously, you don't want them to go under 89, but they could still live, you know, they kind of live at the lower level. Sometimes, a lot of times, they'll have a chronic cough, they'll be wheezing. Respiratory infections will cause them to exacerbate. They'll have sputum color, like brown sputum color. They kind of, a lot of them get pneumonia and flu, which is why you want to get them vaccinated against flu. Um, in terms of oxygen safety, you always want to keep oxygen away from cooking, gas, avoid flammable substances. You never want to smoke when you have oxygen. You don't want to smoke in the first place, but if you're going to smoke, not when you have oxygen or not near somebody with oxygen. Chronic bronchitis is it, um, like we just spoke about over here that um, COPD includes emphysema and chronic bronchitis. Emphysema is going to have like barrel chest, like an enlarged um, lungs, and chronic bronchitis is saying that their inflamed bronchial tubes always have excessive mucus production. Excessive mucus production can block airways, and they have a chronic cough. So for them, you want to give them something that could help them get out the mucus, like bifenazine, chest physiotherapy, like being in the chest, so that it could help them move their secretions, airway clearance devices for the same reason, increase fluids, etc. Aspiration pneumonia is caused by aspirated material leading to inflammation and bacterial growth. Risk factors for that is people who have difficulty swallowing, compromised gag reflex, tube feeding, or with dementia. So what I like to do to prevent it is to thicken the liquids, elevate the head of bed, etc. 
When you hear it crackles, if you're listening to someone's lung and you hear it crackles, usually that's a sign of fluid overload. Two, respiratory failure is from alveoli, capillary membrane damage, symptoms, usually mental changes, hypoxia, dyspnea, and the priority is always the Lung contusion is caused by blunt chest trauma, so bang into the chest. Monitor for symptoms like shortness of breath, tachypnea, which is a fast respiratory rate, tachycardia, a fast heart rate. You want to treat them with oxygen, medication, ventilator support if needed. A pleural effusion is fusion, which is fluid around the lungs. Usually they've seen that with a chest x-ray or a CAT scan, and they could treat it with diuretics or if needed um, to take out the fluid with thoracentesis. What thoracentesis is, is a procedure to remove the excess pleural fluid. They sit upright, patients leave them forward. The, some complications could be a pneumothorax. What a pneumothorax is, a pneumothorax is ear in the pleural space, so causing the lungs to collapse. So usually they'll be in respiratory distress, <clears throat> sorry, usually they'll be in respiratory distress, really fast heart rate, hypotension, this is an emergency, and then they put in the chest tube. One type of pneumothorax is a tension pneumothorax, and the problem with that is that ear is trapped in the space. There's not even a leak for it to go. It's just trapped. One thing you might see is tracheal deviation, and that needle decompression, chest tube placement, etc. Sorry, I'm going fast because this is a one-hour review of everything, basically. Pulmonary edema, and that's why I said it's for people who really already know this and just want a quick review right before the test. Pulmonary edema, edema is swelling or fluid, so in the pulmonary, so there's excess fluid in the alveoli. Any fluid or any ear or anything else like that in the lungs is obviously an emergency because then it could affect their breathing. So you'll have the same, with respiratory, usually you'll have the same symptoms, shortness of breath, fast heart rate, fast breathing, stuff like that. It's usually treated by the same thing. Oxygen, if they have fluid there, you want to give them diuretic. We go on to pneumonia, pneumonia. Is lung inflammation caused by some bacteria or virus? Symptoms, they usually have chills, cough, fever, chest pain. Ronchi is low-pitched wheezing, heard over large airways during expiration. Could be exacerbated by a lot of different stuff from, from the weather to many different stuff could cause asthma to exacerbate. Usually hear, hear that wheezing and the chest tightness. You can assess the severity of it through peak flow meter, treat with bronchodilators to dilate because the wheezing is constriction. You want to dilate it and give them steroids. Now we go into more of GI type of stuff. Hiatal hernia is when part of the stomach pushes through, so it kind of protrudes out. Causes could be stuff that increase the pressure in the abdomen, like pregnancy, obesity, someone who's weightlifting. Some symptoms they'll have is usually a heartburn. Sometimes they won't even have any symptoms from a hernia. They'll just cough and it will come out. Some interventions will obviously be to address whatever causes it. So if it's from obesity, weight loss, bowel obstruction is an obstruction. So it's a blockage in the bowel. Symptoms are going to be nausea, vomiting, abdominal distension because it's all staying in there. It's not coming out. It could lead to infection, sepsis, perforation. So you do want to um, treat it. What the Valsalva maneuver is, is that it's holding down and bearing down to increase the pressure. So it's like going, it's, a, it's like if someone's going to the bathroom and pushing. Um, you want to avoid it in people where you don't want extra pressure, in, like a stroke, head injuries, um, a heart disease, increase in intracranial pressure. What an ileostomy is, a surgical procedure to create an opening from the small intestines. A colostomy is a surgical procedure to create an opening of the large intestines. Anytime you see the word scopy, like bronchoscopy, it just means a scope, like to visualize. So they put tube in there and they visualize what it is. So for bronchoscopy, you're visualizing the respiratory tract, or as opposed to the colonoscopy, you're visualizing the colon, the rectum. Before they do a colonoscopy, they do have to make them NPO. They have to give them some sort of laxative or go lightly to help them empty the whole thing or else they can't see it if they put a scope in and it's full of stool, they can't see anything. So generally they have to clean um, out the area with some sort of laxative before. A peg tube is something that we do for feeding tube placement. Peritonitis is inflammation of the abdominal 
the cavity lining. As we know, itis is inflammation. The enema is introducing liquid into the rectum. It's commonly given for someone who is constipated, especially in, if they failed something oral. GERD is gastric reflux. As we know, a lot of times it's caused by diet. Some stuff like citrus food, chocolate, alcohol could increase it, so you want to tell them to go off of that. So the Billyworth one, abdominoplasty, are gastric procedures. One's a tummy tuck, one's to, to lose weight. Dumping syndrome is something you want to watch out for after surgery. So it's when food moves into the small intestines very rapidly, and this could lead to poor nutrient absorption. If you have someone who's malnourished, and then you give them a bunch of food, you could have something known as refeeding syndrome. So you want to, if the person hasn't been fed, you don't want to just be giving them a five-course meal. You want to introduce food very slowly and see what they can handle. Abdominal aortic aneurysm dissection is a tear in the wall of the abdominal aorta, so that's where the blood is. It is often requiring surgical intervention, and usually they'll have symptoms as severe abdominal or severe back pain. Paralytic ileus is an obstruction in the intestines due to paralysis, as the name says, paralytic, paralysis. So if it's paralyzed, you think of intestines, usually they go like this to move the food down, so there's no contraction of it, so you're going to get backed up. IBD and IBS. IBD is an umbrella term for bowel inflammation causing conditions, causing tissue damage. That includes Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. IBS is irritable bowel syndrome. It's more like chronic bowel conditions. So in IBD, there's inflammation. In IBS, there is not. And in, under what's inflammation, you're going to have Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. Ulcerative colitis would be just in the colon, and Crohn's could be anywhere in the digestive tract. Both will have abdominal pain, diarrhea, weight loss, etc. And you want to do dietary changes. Sometimes they could need surgery, but first stop would be dietary changes. Diverticulitis is inflammation and infection of a diverticula. What diverticula is, it's small pouches in the colon. So those small pouches, diverticula, are getting itis, which is inflammation. They usually have changes in their bowel habits, habits, fevers, abdominal pain. Peptic ulcer, ulcer is an opening, a sore. So peptic ulcer is an opening, a sore in the stomach. So a lot of times they'll have like burning feeling, heartburn, stuff like that. The treatment would be a proton pump inhibitor. When we talk about thyroid, so hypothyroidism, like I like to think of it like this. Hypothyroidism, too little thyroid. Everything just slows. The person gets weight gain. The person just tired, um, stuff like that. Hyper is the opposite. They're, they usually have weight loss. Everything's really fast. They have a lot of energy, stuff like that. And hypothyroidism, when it's really severe and it leads to like decreased consciousness, hypothermia, that's what we call myxedema coma. And if it's too severe, hyper, then we call it thyroid storm, which could lead to organ dysfunction. So you do want to just remember that hypothyroidism, really severe, is myxedema coma. Hyperthyroidism, really like that's and severe, would be a thyroid storm. For hypothyroidism, it's generally treated with Synthroid, which is levothyroxine. For hyperthyroidism, it would be radioactive iodine, medications like PTU, methamazole. Grave disease is an autoimmune disease. When we say autoimmune, we mean the body attacks itself. So for some reason, the body is attacking its thyroid and it causes an overproduction of the thyroid hormones. Usually the key symptom they'll ask you is like a bulging eye, ptosis, a bulging eye. Thyroidectomy, anytime you say ectomy, it means it's removal, surgical removal of the thyroid. Cholecystitis, itis means inflammation, and then we're talking about the gallbladder. It's usually caused by gallstones, and they'll have abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting. Treatment consists of bowel rest, dietary changes, antibiotics, pain medications, and in some cases, its removal, which is known as cholecystectomy. When we talk about the kidneys, what dialysis is, is that it's removing the waste. In someone with kidney failure, their kidneys are not working, and the kidneys are the ones that filter everything. So dialysis, the process of removing the waste, filtering it just like the kidney would do.
The two different types, um, we have hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis. Hemodialysis would be, they would, they would put like a fistula, they access it from the arm or chest, wherever they put the fistula. Peritoneal dialysis would be in the stomach. And hemodialysis, they would go three days, three days a week, either Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or whatever their setup is. Peritoneal dialysis would be something that we do at home. An AV fistula would be for hemodialysis, and that is a surgical connection of the artery and the vein so they could access and start dialysis. A complication of hemodialysis is DDS, dialysis disequilibrium syndrome. What happens is, is that there's a, a rapid shift in concentration of solutes in the brain and the blood, and this causes neurosymptoms. So just to prevent that, you want to gradually adjust um, and monitor it and slow down if that does happen. When we talk about kidney stones, nephrolithiasis are kidney stones. They're small deposits in the kidney. They usually cause flank pain. They could also have blood in the urine, hematuria. You want to hydrate, pain medication. There are different procedures to remove kidney stones. If they're small enough, they can pass itself. If they're not, you could use some procedures like nephrolithotripsy or ESWL which is a shock wave to break it down so that it passes. So too big for that. Pyelonephritis could happen from untreated urinary tract infection. So if you think about the anatomy, you have your bladder and then you have ureters and the kidneys. So if some a urinary tract infection, a UTI wasn't treated, it goes right up to the kidneys. So that would be pyelonephritis. Nephritic syndrome, I'll actually talk about that later when we come to the kids. So let's get that. Pheochromocytoma is a rear adrenal gland tumor and it causes excessive adrenaline and noradrenaline so you'll have a rapid heart rate sweaty just think about all your symptoms of adrenaline just fast 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 fight or flight fast and because it's a tumor you'll need surgery to remove it pelvic fracture is a fracture of the pelvis usually it's from like an elderly who falls it could be from an mva motor vehicle accident whenever in general, you want to assess for internal hemorrhage, something you can't see. So you'll be looking for signs of distension, vial signs, hemoglobin. PID is pelvic inflammatory disease, and it's an infection of the female reproductive organ due to upward spread of bacteria from the genital tract. It's usually caused by untreated STDs, STIs. So risk factors, people who, who would get STIs, like multiple sex partners, previous STDs, TIs, unprotected sex. Symptoms, they'll have lower pelvic pain, menstrual irregularities, painful intercourse, abnormal vaginal discharge. Stascopy, scopy is, we'll put in a tube, go in to see, to visualize. So that would be just of the bladder and the urethra of the bladder. Priapism is a prolonged painful erection over two hours. Symptoms of bluish discoloration, a rigid penis, difficult to urinate, and obviously in real pain. Paraphimosis is the inability to return the foreskin to original position, so it's pushed up, but it can't be pushed back to original position. Pain, swelling, and it's actually, it impairs the blood flow, because think about a ring on your finger, it, you know, it's the same type of thing. There's um, constriction going on that's impairing the blood flow. So, usually it occurs from the foreskin being retracted for an extended period. Testicular torsion is, is a medical emergency. It's when the, it's exactly as the name says, is it twists. And it cuts the blood supply to testicle. It's urgent. You need to treat it within four to six hours to save the testicle. And usually they'll come in with severe, severe testicular pain. When we're doing a urine specimen, when we're collecting it, you want to avoid collecting from the bag. You want to use the catheter pour, clean the pour with alcohol, aspirate, and transfer aseptically to the cup. When we do timed urine collection tests, you want to, after the first void is when you want to start the collection. Urinary incontinence or an overactive bladder is just random bladder contractions causing st strong urges. Usually it could be from neuro diseases, spinal cord injuries, etc. Stress incontinence is incontinence, but only with stress. So normally they don't leak, but with stress, like with coffee and with running, then they'll leak a little bit. So you want to help them do bladder training, pelvic floor exercises, etc. A urinary tract infection is, as its name says, infection in the urinary tract. You want to have proper patient education, teach them how to wipe from front to back, avoid holding the urine in, drink fluids, wear cotton because 
that was his last year to track infections. And I wrote the symptoms vary with age. They could come in with altered mental status. That will be their only symptom. And they'll have a urinary tract infection. What a vasectomy is, is permanent male sterilization. You just want to tell them to use alternate birth control until sperm-free semen is confirmed. What a TERP is, is a transurethral resection of the prostate. They scope to remove prostate tissue. Post-op, if your patient says, hey, I have red or, you know, blood in my urine, it, that's normal. Small clots are normal, not big clots, small clots. You want to continually irrigate it. BPH is very common as men get older. It's prostate enlargement, usually age-related. But the problem is when it gets too big, it pushes against the bladder. So then they'll have trouble going completely empty because it's pushing against there. So they have medication, lifestyle changes. Possibly it could be surgery if medication didn't work. Prostitis, itis, inflammation of the prostate due to bacterial infections. Obviously, it's bacteria, so we want to treat it with antibiotics. So we go into myasthenia gravis. That's an autoimmune disorder and it blocks acetylcholine receptors. And the initial, what it's going to do is going to cause muscle weakness. And the initial muscles that are going to be affected are the ocular, so the eyes, the face, chewing, swelling. Symptoms you might see is ptosis, all well, eye symptoms, because like I said, it affects eye ptosis, the blopia, muscle weakness, because that's what it causes throughout, throughout the day. The treatment for that is going to be an anticholinesterase. You want them to have the flu, the ammonia vaccines, etc. The complication is myasthenia crisis, so you do want to watch out for that, and that's respiratory muscle failure, because your respiratory is also a muscle, so that you want to watch out for. Some triggers could be stress, infection, under medication. Quadriplegic or also known as tetraplegic is complete paralyzation of the upper and lower limb due to usually a cervical spinal cord injury. What you always want to watch out for is assess the respiratory status and because it's always A, B, C, airway always first. GBS, Gillian Barre syndrome, it causes Ascending muscle paralysis. So you want to think of ascending muscle paralysis going upwards. Symptoms they'll have respiratory failure because, again, muscle paralysis, shallow respiration. That's always what you want to watch out for. Ankylosing spondylitis is an inflammatory disease of the spine. You want to monitor for morning stiffness, lower back pain, we're talking about the spine. When it comes to external fixation, we're talking about metal pins and screws throughout the skin to stabilize bone. You want to assess the site for signs of infection. You want to make sure it's sterile pin care so that you're not giving the person an infection and assess for neurovascular intact. Osteomalacia is a reversible bone disorder caused by vitamin D deficiency. Symptoms are going to be weak, soft, painful bones that are more prone to fracture. You always want to make sure safety first, just in general. Calcium, vitamin D, all these supplements. Osteomyelitis, serious bone infection, and it requires long-term antibiotic treatment. Osteo, anytime we say osteo, we're talking about bone, by the way. That's why they're all osteo. Osteogenesis imperfecta is a rare genetic disease, but it causes brittle bones. So anytime we speak about weak or brittle bones and they're prone to fractures that's what you want to watch out for it's an autosomal dominantly inherited disease minimize whatever you could to prevent them from getting fractures osteopenia is more more than normal bone loss for their age or sex vitamin d calcium weight bearing exercises for all bone related stuff osteoarthritis is a degeneration. It's like a wear and tear. As you get older, and more people have osteoarthritis, they'll have they'll have crepitus, morning stiffness, decreased mo mobility. Osteoporosis is reduced bone density. Always calcium, vitamin D, weight bearing exercises, M4 prevention. When we're talking about bones, Parkinson's is a progressive, unfortunately, neuro disorder caused by bradykinesia, rigidity and tremors. Treatment for that is usually levodopa, cardiodopa. ALS, unfortunately, is also progressive, and it's progressive loss of motor neurons leading to muscle weakness. Symptoms from fatigue, muscle weakness, all the way to respiratory failure. 
obviously respiratory goes first, respiratory support. Multiple sclerosis is a progressive, also progressive demyelinization of central nervous system causing muscle weakness and inclination and balance. With multiple sclerosis, they'll have periods of times where they're perfectly fine for years and then they'll have a exacerbation. Rhabdomyolysis is breakdown of muscle tissue leading to dark colored urine. It could be from over-exercising, dehydration, trauma. You want to give them rapid fluid is the, is the key to prevent kidney damage. What fibromyalgia is, is that it's chronic pain disorder causing widespread pain, fatigue, sleep disturbances. You want to manage them with medication like gabapentin, sprain, injury, always with muscle injuries, rest, ice, compression, elevation. Full tunnel, we have um, medial nerve compression. You'll have tunnel sign. Quota equina syndrome is motor and sensory defects from injuries to L4 to L5. They'll have severe lower back pain. All of a sudden, they can't walk. They work for perfectly fine, and all of a sudden, they can't walk. And saddle anesthesia. It's a medical emergency that requires you to reduce the pressure on the nerves. So it's surgery. they got to quickly do surgery. Rheumatoid arthritis is chronic autoimmune condition causing painful joint inflammation. So you want to know about those two joints that are inflamed. Symptoms will have symmetrical pain, swelling, morning stiffness. Interventions would be DMARDs, joint protection, and frequent rest, rest pain control. Septic arthritis is inf infection in a joint. It's actually a medical emergency. It's an infection, so you give antibiotics. Fat immobilization is when a little piece, a little fatty material, goes off and it's life threatening. It could occur after a fracture. So you want to early stabilize the injury, surgery, and minimize movement. What compartment syndrome is that it's increased pressure within a confined space leading to tissue ischemia. So think about a kid who has a cast, a really, really, really tight cast. So there's increased pressure in that confined space. So usually they have these symptoms, the six Ps, I like to call it pain, pallor, pulsences, parasites, so, so pins and needles, hypothermia, paralysis. They also have pain out of proportion. So urgent intervention is needed and a fasciotomy, they got to open it up and relieve that pressure there. It's going to skip a little bit because a little tad time. Carling's fracture is when it's a wrist fracture from the fall. So if you, someone's falling and all of a sudden they break their fall because they put out their hands, outstretched hands, so that would be Collins fracture. When we go to sugar and diabetes, metabolic syndrome is a cluster of conditions that is, increases one's risk for heart disease, stroke, type 2 diabetes. So that would be diagnosed based off the waist, waist circumference, blood pressure, triglycerides, HDL, etc. Hypoglycemia, we spoke about before. I'll quickly go through it. It's a, a glucose level, a blood sugar level under 70. They'll be confused, anxious, restlessness. You always want to check the blood sugar to make sure it's the right number. You could give them um, 15 grams of simple carbohydrate like orange juice, but if they're not conscious, then you do IV glucagon. And you always want to monitor the blood sugar. DKA, diabetic ketoacidosis, is the opposite. It's hyperglycemia, way too high sugar. They'll have high sugars in the 400s. They'll have even 600s, 800s. And that's usually from poor self-management, stress, insufficient insulin. They'll have cosmal respirations, nausea, vomiting. The key over there is to give them insulin, but also fluid, monitor the blood sugar. On a sick day for a diabetic, you want to make sure, usually by a sick day, you're not eating, that's fine. But for a diabetic, you do want to make sure that you're checking the blood sugar much more closely. They are still drinking. Peripheral neuropathy is nerve damage, and you want to make sure daily foot care because what happens is that they can't feel it, and they have nerve damage, then they can step on something, have an infection under the toe, but not even know it. When it comes to alcohol, alcohol is CNS, central nervous system depression people who are alcohol they'll have thiamine deficiency so you do want to replace that when someone's intoxicated you know you'll see they can't walk straightly on a, a line so they're imbalanced slurred speech to confuse when they withdraw so they're away from alcohol for a period of time and they usually take it daily they'll have tremors they'll be really agitated hepatitis is inflammation itis inflammation hepatitis is inflammation of the liver Cirrhosis is something usually from alcoholics, progressive 
a liver disease. Hepatic encephalopathy, you want to know we give lactulose for that. For ascites, we have a fluid accumulation in the peritoneal space. So you got to drain that out that fluid with the paracentesis. Put a needle in, they take out the fluid. I go on to neuro. With neuro, we talk about a basal skull fracture. Symptoms of that are ecchymosis, so like bruising around the eye. They look like raccoon eyes, I like to call them. You can have a cerebral spinal fluid leak. When we talk about a stroke, we have ischemic stroke and a hemorrhagic stroke, one from a clot and one from bleeding. The symptoms will be the same pretty much for both, fast, facial drooping, arm weakness, speech difficulties, and time is key. Yeah, if it's a clot, you want to give thrombolytic therapy within 4.5 to 4 hours for ischemic stroke. You actually have to make sure it's not a hemorrhagic stroke because you don't want their be giving proplasty medications if it's a bleeding. So with seizure, there are different types of seizures, clonic, tonic, but you do want to, and after the seizure, they'll be in a post ictal stage, or they'll be like, won't really remember, be a little out of it. But you want to make sure that for seizures, the number one thing is turn them on the side so that they don't aspirate, and you want to just make sure that they're safe. So you want to bring them down. If they're standing up, you don't want them to be seizing standing up because they're going to fall down. You want to bring them down carefully on the floor and put them thigh lying so they don't aspirate on their own secretions. You might have to suction their mouth, et cetera. If a seizure lasts more than five minutes, you want to give them IV benzodiazepines like Ativan, and that's called status epileptus. Here's when we talk about respiratory and airway management. So we have mechanical ventilations, which are non-invasive, like BiPAP, which is a huge machine, or we have invasive, which is intubation. For the ventilator alarms, j just know high pressure is there's something there that's causing more pressure. So there's a resistance, a kink, etc. Low pressure is the opposite. There's a leak, a disconnect somewhere. People on ventilators are more at risk for pneumonia. We want to make sure to do oral care take care of them. What a chest tube is, it's used to remove air or fluid from the lungs or heart. We have a wet suction, dry suction system. You want to make sure to keep the chest tube below the patient's chest. If you have some problems like dislodgement, etc., you want to insert the tube into sterile water if the system breaks. In terms of cancer, the warning signs of cancer are usually mnemonic caution, some changes, sore that doesn't heal, Unusual bleeding, discharge. It's usually stuff that just don't go away. Like if you have a cough, but it's a nagging cough, it just doesn't go away. Or weight loss, that's unexplained, stuff like that. Radiation causes a slew of side effects, and so does chemo. With chemo, you want they are immunosuppressed, they have bone marrow suppression. So you want to have precautions, you want to be very careful with them, you want to have reverse isolation, that you're scared of them getting sick. One thing you want to watch out for is tumor lysis syndrome, which is a rapid release of intracellular components from the dying cancer cells into the bloodstream. This could lead to organ dysfunction. Here you can see really quickly, anaphylactic reaction is a life-threatening allergic reaction. We give epinephrine for that. You have different types of contraceptive. Here are just some eyes terms that you should know, like strabismus is cross eyes, retinoblastoma is cancer in the in the retina, and what they, you'll see is a white pupil. Glaucoma is increased pressure in the eye, retinal detachment could lead to blindness, so you do want to watch out for that. Macular degeneration is usually age-related, but it's dry and wet, and cataracts is cloudy vision. Huntington disease is autosomal dominant progressive nerve degeneration that's categorized by chorea, which is involuntary jerky rapid movements. It's usually confirmed by genetic testing because it's an autosomal dominant disease. Gout usually occurs in the big toe, but it could occur other places. It's inflammation from a uric acid accumulation. SLE is systemic lupus erythematosus, which is an autoimmune, so the body's fighting itself, caused by chronic inflammation. There are flare-ups and remission, but you do want to know that, that it could affect the heart, CNS, skin, muscles. One symptom that they like to ask on the NCLEX is a butterfly rash. They could also have other symptoms like joint pain because it's affecting all different, it depends what organ it's affecting, but joint pain if it's affecting the muscle, joints, kidney issues if it's affecting the kidneys. Hypothermia is a really low temperature. There's a risk for someone who's homeless, obviously, because they're outside, so they're more exposed to the temperature, and that could lead to cardiac failure. Obstructive sleep apnea is when there's obstruction in the airway, 
And usually with the main symptom for that would be they're snoring really loudly or it's caused by like treats of cause. So it's caused by obesity, weight loss, but the CPAP machine would be the treatment for obstructive sleep apnea. Malignant hypothermia is usually inherited muscle abnormality and it's usually caused by anesthesia. So after anesthesia, it's a lot of times it is genetic. So they'll ask you if a family member did it. They'll have a rigid jaw, fever, rigidity after anesthesia. And the treatment for that is IV dentrolin. Frostbite and brain phenomena. They are both vasoconstriction from cold. You'll see color changes, purple fingers. You want to warm. You don't want to put it in hot, whatever. You want to slowly warm them up, wear gloves, etc. Marfan syndrome is a connective tissue disorder leading to a variety of physical and medical features. Really tall stature like Abraham Lincoln, long limbs like that. But you do want to know that it could lead to visual and cardiac defects, so you want to watch out for that. Now we went through the med surge. Now we'll go on to the rest. Sorry for going so fast, but this is pretty much what it is. A quick review for someone who's taking the test. It's really not for somebody who's learning, just learning about all the diseases. Here are just some viruses. These I'm just going to really quickly skim through because you just have to know which one's contact, which one's airborne, which one's not. So scabies, the main thing is very itchy. Permethrin cream would be, you would put on it, Ebola. We all know that. Very strict precautions, highly contagious, and unfortunately, it's not treatment for that. The West Nile virus is mosquito-borne. Ringworm is fungal, and usually they'll have like rings, as the name says, like circle rings. Drug-resistant organisms like MRSA, VRE, are contact precautions. C. diff, excessive diarrhea they'll have. That's contact precautions because it's spread through the diarrhea. Treatment would be metronidazole vancomycin. Poison ivy is actually not contagious, but you do want to wash affected area. Eczema is not contagious either, but it'll have really intense itching, dry skin. Usually the treatment for that is steroids and moisturizer and avoid whatever triggers it. Psoriasis is dry, scaly, silverly plaque. So if you see silverly plaque, you want to think of psoriasis. Bed bugs will be little tiny red rashes. You want to get a professional pest control. Lyme disease is going to be your classic bullseye rash. Antibiotics. Oral thrush is caused by antibiotics for oral care. So you give them a nice that thing, which is antifungal, swish it around their mouth. HIV is through blood or sexual contact, and usually they'll do an antiviral therapy or ART. Bacterial vaginosis is fish-like vaginal odor. And you'll give them antibiotics for that. Herpes zoster is shingles. Here are some just more um, viruses and STDs. So trick, they'll have malodorous vaginal discharge. You'll treat the partner, give them antibiotics. Same thing with gonorrhea, chlamydia. The problem is that, that has a complication for pelvic inflammatory disease and infertility. So you do want to treat it. TB is airborne. Symptoms will have weight loss, low-grade fever, co-op. It's usually diagnosed through a chest x-ray. When we talk about vaccines, I just want you to know that mild reactions like fever, sore arm are all normal after vaccines. You do want to know that live vaccines should be avoided in people who are immunocomprom severely immunocompromised and pregnant. Okay, now we go on to psych. Psych is quite simple. We have our phobias. Phobia means that we're scared of it. So just the name. School phobia means that we're scared of school. Zoophobia means we're fear of animals. Agrophobia means we have a fear of being outdoors or in a situation where we can't really escape. In general, you always want to avoid panicking. Usually the big concern of psych is always safety first. Safety, they're not suicidal, they're safe. And then you do the intervention. If they have a phobia, don't want them to like, okay, you never have to go to school again, but you want to slowly bring it back and introduce it to therapy slowly. Social anxiety disorder, just as the name says, fear of social settings. Stress disorder, we have acute stress disorder and PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Acute is just as the name said, it's very acute. You always want to assess for self-harm, suicidal thoughts, and give them coping strategies. With PTSD, it's usually post-traumatic stress disorder, like they'll be in the military or go through a really traumatic experience, and then they'll relive it sometimes. So someone when in the military, they'll hear a bang, they'll run under the table. So you do want to discuss a traumatic event whenever they're ready to talk about it, go through therapy. Schizophrenia, they'll have positive symptoms and negative. The positive symptoms are in addition. Normally, you won't be hallucinating, you won't be delusional. So these are additional symptoms that usually we don't have, but now 
it's in addition to that. Negative symptoms are the opposite. So normally people talk and you have an effect. Oh, your mother died and you're like, oh, I'm so sorry, as opposed to like a flat effect. Someone says, oh, your mother died and you say, okay, it's just like no effect. So that would be the opposite negative. Interventions, the number one thing is you want to assess for command hallucinations because they could hallucinate, but if it's command, like someone's commanding them, like go kill that person that you need to know about and you need to make sure they're safe and the other person's safe. Someone is hallucinating, you do not want to argue with them and say, no, that's not true. You just want to reinforce reality. Oh, we're in a hospital or oh, whatever, but you don't want to argue with them. When we talk about depression, risk factors for depression or for suicidal thoughts, number one thing for depression you want to watch out is for suicide. So you always want to ask for that. Bipolar, bi is two, so they literally are two different personalities. Sometimes they're manic, really high, really loud, nonstop, then low, depressed, not getting out of bed for a week. So they go from high to low. The reason why you want to offer energy and dense foods is because when they're manic, they don't eat. They just go, 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 go. For people with delirium and dementia, so delirium is just an acute confusion. Someone could be sick and just be confused, but then after you treat them, they know where they are. They're perfectly fine. So dementia is just memory loss, but it's not acute. It's unfortunately progressive and chronic. You want to make sure they're both safe, prevent wandering, make sure they're safe, be very structured, etc. Here are some ch childhood psych disorders. ADHD is attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. You want to make sure they're getting the right care, they're in the right place, they're getting the right behavioral health, offer them choices, advocate for their services. With autism spectrum disorder, usually they'll have repetitive behaviors, they're very difficult in social places, like they won't look at you. You want to give them a calm environment, structure, and consistency. In terms of personality disorder, we have three different clusters. Cluster A is odd, eccentric, so we have people who are paranoid. Schizoid is socially detached, they're very detached socially, and schizotypal is um, when they have extreme discomfort in social situations. The cluster B is dramatic, emotional, and erratic. So antisocial, even though it sounds like that they're just not social, but it's actually it means that they have a disregard for others' rights. They violate others' rights. They have a lack of remorse. Borderline personality is they have unstable relationship. They're very impulsive. N narcissistic is they have these grandiose fantasies. They have no empathy for other people. They need people to admire, to admire them. It's all about me, 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 me. Histrionic is someone who is very shallow emotions, they're not deep, they just like to have attention, everyone look at me, they're attention seeking. And cluster C is people who are anxious and fearful. So dependent is someone, exactly as the name says, they're dependent, they're very clingy, they're scared of rejection, they need constant reassurance, does this look good, does this look good, does this look good. Obsessive compulsive is that they're preoccupied with the rules, they keep having to do it again and again and again. They need perfection. Here's some eating disorders, anorexia, bulimia. The difference um, that you might see is with bulimia that they eat regular, but they vomit it up. So you might see their teeth be eroded, signs of vomiting. You also might see their BMI might be normal because they are eating as opposed to some anorexic, usually has weight loss. If you are going to physically restrain someone, which you do want to do the last resort, not the first. You do want to assess their skin every two hours, range of motion, basic needs like toileting. With panic attack or anything with psych or anything in general, safety first. A codependent behavior is someone who enables someone else. So like the wife enables the husband to be an alcoholic. She buys him alcohol. She helps him like that. Okay, now we go on to maternity. So pregnancy. In pregnancy, there are certain changes which are normal in pregnancy. Number one, morning sickness is normal. Usually you want them to eat frequent, but more just spaced out as opposed to one huge meal, ginger, cracker. You want to take fol folic acid in pregnancy to prevent new earth tube defect. You want to avoid certain foods in pregnancy like raw meat, unpasteurized food, fish high in mercury. Like we mentioned before, we do not want to give pregnant women live vaccines, only inactive vaccines. You want to limit the caffeine intake. 
Constipation is very common in pregnancy, so you do want to help them with that. High fiber diet, fluids, exercise. And it's normal to have a little bit of a decrease in blood pressure. Obviously not too low, but a little bit of decrease. Here's some tests that are done in pregnancy. We have the leap pulp maneuver, which put the hands on, on the mother to determine the position of the fetus. Fundal height, we correlate, but we only do with it after 20 weeks. We see how big the baby is. We have the nitrazine pH test, which tests if the if the fluid is actually a ruptured membrane or it's just urine. We have the Bishop score to assess if the if we could induce somebody's cervical readiness for induction. Non-stress test is for the fetal well-being. So mom says I didn't really feel the baby today, so we want to see how the how the baby's doing. We do a non-stress test. GPS is group B streptococcus. If it's positive, you would give the mom antibiotics. Indirect Coombs test is a test after trauma, so after MVA, just to make sure the blood's in a mix. Nagel's rule is used to determine the due date. Okay, so pregnancy complications. Gestational hypertension is hypertension, but it's only after 20 weeks. So if they had a hypertension at eight weeks, that's not gestational hypertension. If it's not treated, it could lead to preeclampsia, which... Um, seizures and the only cure for that is really delivery help syndrome is a really severe form of preeclampsia and as its name says it affects the liver and the blood because h is for hemolysis e is for elevated liver enzymes l is for a low platelet count hypermesis gravidarum is so normal morning sickness is normal unfortunately with pregnancy but it's when they cannot keep down anything they just keep vomiting they can't eat anything they just keep vomiting so usually they lose a lot of weight and that could lead to early pregnancy, could lead to a lot of different stuff. So ectopic pregnancy is when it's a fertilized egg, but it's just that the pregnancy occurs outside of the uterus. So it's not a viable pregnancy. Molar pregnancy is when the patient has symptoms of pregnancy. They think they're pregnant, but it's actually a tumor, unfortunately. Supine hypotension could occur in the third trimester. It's when the mom lays back and then they compress the vena cava and they'll have hypotension. So you want them to turn on their side if that happens. Here are fetal movements. So we like to use veal chop. As you see over here, veal stands for variable decelerations. The causes would be chop and the interventions would be mine. So for instance, accelerations are okay and no interventions are needed. Early decelerations, could, the cause for that is head compression, intervention not necessarily like that. So labor medication, we have oxytocin, which stimulates contraction. In general, whatever medication you're taking, you want to watch out. It doesn't do too much of that. So if it's stimulating contraction, you don't want the contraction to be too fast because then the baby's not getting oxygen. Narcotics could cause fetal sedation, so you want to avoid that. Epidural is what's given usually. We give it earlier, like they don't give it while you're actively pushing it too late for that. Some complications that could happen in labor, shoulder dystocia is an emergency. It's when the shoulder gets stuck during labor, so while the baby is descending. Meconium aspiration is when the baby passes its first bowel movement, but in the mom. Umbilical cord prolapse, it's when the umbilical cord comes out before the presenting part of the baby. Placenta abruption is the premature separation of the placenta from the uterus, and that would also need medical emergency. Placenta T is when the placenta attaches too deeply into the uterine wall, requires a C-section, careful in management. Placenta previa is when the placenta covers the opening of the cervix. So that causes painless bleeding. And I like to think about it as PP, painless and previa. Postpartum, you want to watch out for vaginal discharge. You want to watch out for bleeding. You want to watch out for signs of atony, like a boggy uterus because you want to make sure the uterus is shrinking back. You also want to watch out for hemorrhage. You don't want them to be losing too much blood after. Soaking more than one pad is always abnormal. Postpartum psychosis is rare, but it's a medical emergency, and it's really could be a harm for the baby. So you want to make sure the baby and the mom are both safe. Mongolian spots, it looks like a bruise on the baby, but it's actually, um, so you want to document that, because you want to make sure that no one thinks it's abuse. If someone's born with Down syndrome, they might have a single transverse crease on the palm and the ear slightly lower down. 
With the Zika virus, it caused microcephaly, which is a small head, and other defects. Okay, now we go on to pediatric. So pediatric, it's all about growth and development. Obviously, what's normal for a three-month-year-old to be doing, you want a nine-month-year-old to be a little progressed and doing other stuff. So you do want to know, I do have a quick video with the mnemonics, an easy way to remember all them, so you can watch that above. But here are reflexes. The moral reflex is, and you want to know when they should disappear because it's abnormal if they're there for longer or if they're not there. Moral reflex is when you suddenly, like a bang, and then the baby startles and arches, um, arches everything back, arms out and everything like that. It, it should disappear after three to six months. The Babinski reflex is when you stroke the, the foot and their toes fan out like that. It should disappear after 9 to 12 months. Rooting is when you sh their cheek and then they move their head towards you and begin sucking, like to eat. It should disappear after 3 to 4 months. 4 months is generally when we start solids, usually 4 to 6 months. And at 6 months, they have their first dental visit. You do want them to double their weight by 6 months. Cogenital diseases, cogenital means that they were born with it. So heart disease, congenital heart disease is a heart disease that they were born with. Tetralogy of fallow is a congenital heart defect categorized by four different heart defects. So number one is pulmonary stenosis, which is a narrowing. Number two is ventricular septal defect, which means that there's a hole between the ventricles. And the problem with all these stuff is that the blood it's all blood flow. So we're talking about a hole between the ventricles and the oxygenated blood could go back to the DX. It mixes them both. The third one is right ventricular hypertrophy, which is a thickening of the right ventricle. If you think about the heart as a muscle, so just like you'd work out your muscles, uh, if it's overworked, it would get thickened and bigger. Overriding aorta is that the aorta is over the ventricular septal defect and not over the left ventricle. With this, you will see Tetralogy of fallow, well, first of all, they'll be cyanotic because they're not getting oxygenated blood because it's being mixed. Second of all, they'll have tet spells, which is hypercyanotic episodes. They'll, they'll squat to be able to get the most um, oxygen. Coarctation of the aorta is usually narrowing of the aorta, and you'll see a difference between the pulses from the top and the bottom. Patent ductus arteriosus is that the ductus arteriosus is supposed to close after birth. It's open, while in utero, it's supposed to close after birth. So what happens is the oxygenated blood from the left flows back to the lungs. Here are just some other congenital anomalies. Trisomy 21, Down syndrome, like I said, the single palm crease, and usually they'll have little ears a little set down. They're at risk for cardiac defects. Trisomy 18 is Edwards syndrome. Unfortunately, it's life-threatening, and usually they die within the first few years. Developmental dysplasia of the lip is a hip abnormality that we that we routinely check. We check the you know, the hips by newborn assessments. They'll put a pavlic harness to to treat it, and what it does is that it maintains the hip in in a flex and adducted position. So you, as a nurse, want to know to do regular skin care underneath there, so the skin doesn't go bad underneath there, and proper dressing underneath. Some other pediatric disorders we have pyloric stenosis, which is narrowing of the opening between the stomach and the small intestines, preventing this food from entering. So that's going to cause weight loss. One of the key symptoms, you'll see projectile vomiting, so like shoot out, olive-shaped mass. Hirschsprung disease is from a missing nerve in the colon, so it's just going to cause obstruction. One of the key features you'll see is, is that they didn't pass meconium because the nerve cells are are missing, they'll have green vomit and distended abdomen. Intussusception is an emergency where one of the, the intestines telescopes into the other one. Symptoms you could see is sausage-shaped mass, current jelly, colicky, severe abdominal pain. And the treatment, which could also be diagnosis, is an ear and mouth. With spinal bifida, if it's um, open spinal bifida, then you are at risk for infection, so you do want to cover it. Here are just some other stuff. If someone has a high bilirubin, sometimes they'll do phototherapy. Someone has their tonsils taken out. You want to watch out for bleeding, post-tonsillectomy. And also don't give them like red ices because you don't know where the bleeding's from. Meningitis, they could have neck stiffness, fever, headache. And what they do to diagnose it is a lumbar puncture. 
The parovirus, which is fifth disease, the common symptom that they'll ask you is a slap the face cheeks. They'll have the rosy cheek. And this could be really bad in pregnant women. So you want to stay away from pregnant women. Celiac disease, you'll have a gluten-free diet for that. That's the only treatment. Cystic fibrosis, they have a lot of mucus production and secretions. So you want to give them stuff to thin that and to not so they could breathe better. Sickle cell disease, where they have crises because of the sickling of the cell, changing of the shape, then you'll give them pain medication and IV fluids. Uh, Kakazaki disease is inflammation of the arterial walls. You want to treat with IV, GABA, globulin, and aspirin. And the reason why I mention that is because in general, we don't give aspirin for viruses because it can lead to something known as Ray syndrome. In the case of Kakazaki, that is one of the stuff we do. Will's tumor, which is also known as nephroblastoma, is a malignant renal tumor, tumor so of the kidney. One thing you want to know as a nurse is do not palpate it. Epiglottitis is a life-threatening inflammation of epiglottis, so we're talking about airway obstruction. It's usually caused by HIV, so that's why vaccinations are very important. <clears throat> One of the main signs that they'll ask you for is drooling or change in voice, like a hot potato voice. PKU is that they lack the enzyme for phenylalanine to tyrosine conversion, so they have a life, they'll have to have a lifelong low phenylalanine diet. With hypospadias, they'll have the erythro opening will be under the penis and on top. It's not a medical emergency, but it's usually cor corrected at surgery around 6 to 12 months. Lead poisoning, you want to watch out for typically from painted homes before the 1978. So you want to screen children and it could affect the brain if it's at high level and they usually give chelation therapy if it's too high. For SIDS, which is sudden infant death syndrome, we don't really know the cause, so there's just a lot of... Um, Prevention stuff that we said this could cause, this could cause. So we want to, you know, not co sleep, not breastfeed, you want to stop smoking, but we don't really know the exact cause. And the last thing is incontinence or nocturnal anuresis. So these are stuff that you would assume that the kid is toilet trained, but then goes back. So nocturnal anuresis is bedwetting, but after the patient is already toilet trained. Or someone who has fecal incontinence, which is encopresis, they're soiling their underwear, but that's after. Um, they're already toilet trained. So for, for soiling, then you want to give them laxative therapy, dietary change, if it's a behavior problem, behavior modification, and in general, positive reinforcement, etc. And now we're going to medications. Medications we're going to go through really quickly because for the most part, it's memorization. There's ways to, there's a lot of mnemonics that you could use to help you remember them. So the first class of medications we're going to talk about is anticholinergic. They're used to treat various conditions. And the side effects that you should know is just a mnemonic, can't see, which is blurred vision, can't pee, which is urinary retention, can't shit, which is constipation, and can't spit, which is dry mouth. Examples of anticholinergics are listed over here, but there's so many of them. Proton pump inhibitors are usually used to treat stomach acid production, like GERD, the Oland and Prozole and Topazole, Omeprazole. You, you just want to know long term they could reduce calcium absorption and promote osteoporosis. You want to take them 30 minutes before the meal. Regular, the thing you want to know about that is that you want to report dangerous side effects like EPS and symptoms. EPS symptoms, extrapyramidal symptoms, and those are like movement dysfunction. Antacids, you want to take them apart from other medications. Fibers used to re relieve constipation. Antidiarrheals like emodium or paramide. You don't want to use them for more than two days, and you want to monitor electrolyte and fluid intake. Medications with tuberculosis, you want to know that most of them are hepatotoxics. So they're toxic for the liver. Rifampin, you want to know specifically, could co cause orange body fluid. So you want to warn them about that because that could be quite scary if you don't. You also want to use non-hormonal birth control. In terms of antiemetics, Zofran, Ondasterone, you want to watch out for QT prolongation, so you don't want to prescribe it for someone who is at risk. Antivirals, and then Vir, Alcyclovir, Valcyclovir. Antipsychotics, we have your first generation and your second. Your first generation, also known as typical, their symptoms are neurosymptoms, like extrapyramidal symptoms. 
The second generation, they do have, but not as much, neurosymptoms, but they're mainly known for the metabolic symptoms like glucose. One specific antipsychotic clonzepine could cause agranulocytosis. So you do want to watch out for anything that can make them sick. You want to monitor their white blood cells, report a fever. And the prazotone could cause QT prolongation. With antidepressants in the first place, you want to watch out for suicidal thought. You also want to realize with SSRIs um, that they could take around one to four weeks to see a full effect. So it's not like they take it and they say, oh, it's not working. It has to take some time to, to see their full effect. St. John's work could interact with that. And some side effects of SSRIs are sexual dysfunction. MAOIs is another class of antidepressants, and you want to avoid eating tyramine rich food with that. You also want to have a washout period of around two weeks before starting another antidepressant because it could lead to a hypertensive crisis. One more thing for antidepressants is TCAs, tricyclic antidepressants like amitriptyline could cause cardiac toxicity. So for stimulants, I find the funny because one of the side effects are actually what you would think someone who's stimulated would have, like tachycardia, restlessness, decreased appetite, weight loss. For lithium, lithium is used for bipolar. You want to monitor the sodium levels, the kidney function. You want a very narrow therapeutic range. And risk factors for toxicity would be, I like to call it DDDD, dehydration, diet low in sodium, decreased renal function, and drug to drug interaction. If their toxicity symptoms could be GI, neuro, seizures, encephalopathy, expectorants, mucolytics, we like to mucolytics is thin the mucus in the airway, like guanfenazine. As some medications, they bronchodilate for exacerbations. We want to know about inhalers. You want to rinse them before and after because or else you could get oral thrush. Theophylline is not really commonly used because it requires monitoring for toxicity. Biphosphonates are taken to prevent the loss of bone density. You want to take calcium and vitamin D for strong bones. Um, alpha adrenergic blockers are used to treat BPH. You do want to watch out for the side effects of orthostatic hypertension, syncope. Antibiotics in general, they're obviously used to treat bacterial infections, but they could actually ruin the gut flora. Antibiotics could also lead to C. diff, so if you have frequent liquid stool, afferine, or antibiotics for a period of time, you do want to test them for a seed dip. You want to avoid alcohol, and sometimes prophylactic antibiotics are given in like dental procedures for patients at risk. Here's some different types of antibiotics, different classes like macrolides, thandomycin, azithromycin, clarithromycin. They could cause QT prolongation. They could be toxic for the liver. Aminoglycosides, you want to know that Specifically for that, they could cause ringing in the ear, so ototoxicity, and they're also necrotoxic. Cephalosporin, they usually start in ceph, like ceftriaxone, cephazolin. What you want to know is that they have a cross sensitivity to penicillin. So if someone's allergic to penicillin, like anaphylactically allergic, you want to watch out also for the cephalosporins. Quinolones, like ciprofloxacin, levofloxacin, you want to watch out for this. Um, like a black box warning for risk for tendonitis and tendon rupture. So you do want to watch out for that when people on those. Tetracyclines that will end in cycling, like doxycycline, tetracycline. You want to avoid antacids, dairy with eating them. And some side effects could be photosensitivity and decreased oral contraceptive infections. Penicillins are quite common, moxicillin, emphacillin. We want to know is a lot of times people are allergic to them, or at least they have a hypersensitivity response. In terms of medication to stop smoking, we have nicotine patches, we have Chantix, we have Wolbuterin or Bupropion. For medications that help people stop from drinking alcohol, we have disulfiram. The thing about this is that it causes an unpleasant reaction when alcohol is consumed. So you do want to, I mean, that's what it's supposed to do, but you do want to warn them about this. And you also want to warn them to avoid hidden sources of alcohol. People forget that even some like acne wipes or stuff like that could have alcohol. They should wear a bracelet to alert others of that. Magnesium sulfate can be used for multiple different conditions. Tersadi point, type of magnesium. Seizure. We have... Blood pressure medications, we have different classes. They're pretty easy in terms of they all end in the same thing. So all ACE inhibitors end in pro, all beta blockers end in all, like that. 
with ACE inhibitors, you want to watch out for hyperkalemia, like two hope two high potassium and angioedema. And also with a cough. So as we spoke about before, thyroid medications for anxiety, we could give benzo benzodiazepines like lorazepam. But the thing about that is that they are sedative. With opioids, you want to watch out for respiratory depression. So watch their breathing. And if someone needs someone overdosed, you want to give them naloxone. With NSAIDs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications, they're used for commonly for pain, inflammation, fever, but they could cause GI issues, bleeding issues, who so you want to keep that in mind. Corticosteroids like prednisone, dexamethasone, and then own. And what they do is that they calm down the inflammation, but they also suppress the immune system and they increase the blood sugar. So you want to watch out for someone on that. You don't want to just stop them abruptly. You want to gradually discontinue it. They have medjool packs. They have stuff that taper you off of it. Some side effects from really high steroids would be Cushing syndrome and is a risk for infection. When it comes to diuretics, you want to watch out for electrolyte. Just think about it. What you're doing is you're peeing out stuff. So you want to make sure that their electrolyte function, good kidney function, and they're at risk for hypokalemia, too low potassium. Except for the potassium sparing ones, they keep in the potassium, but otherwise there was for a low potassium. With H1 receptor blockers like antihistamines, so as the name says, they calm down the histamine response. So they're given for rashes. But what you want to know about this is that they could make someone drowsy, like Benadryl, which is also known as diphenhydramine. Tocolytics are used to suppress premature labor. We spoke about that. We spoke about oxytocin, which helps to help contractions get started. The phosphodiesterase inhibitors, what they do is that they promote vasodilation. So they use for erectile dysfunction like Tadafil, Sildenafil, which is known as Viagra. But because they're vasodilating, you want to watch out for hypotension and prolonged erection. Now, for someone who has a cardiac, issue, you do want to watch out for this, especially especially if they're on already like some sort of medication to lower their blood pressure, like a vasodilator, you can put them on this, they might interact and cause a big effect. Anticoagulation is given to prevent blood from clotting, especially for patients that are not moving or have AFib, they're more at risk for clotting. Some examples that we do is heparin, warfarin. So obviously, if it's preventing the blood from clotting, then you want to watch out for bleeding precautions. So Watch out for signs of bleeding. So lastly, we have the thrombolytics. They're used to treat an active blood clot. We have outdoplase, TPA, et cetera. They're contraindicated in someone that has active bleed, recent trauma, and the like. Then we go on to statins. Statins are used to lower cholesterol level. We have ruvastatin, notorvastatin. We want to watch out for muscle-related side effects and liver function. So here are some other information that didn't really fall into one specific thing. So that's why I basically just put it here, but we're almost done. HIPAA obviously is a privacy thing. I can't just talk about any patient in front of anybody. I have to have, I can only disclose it to who the patient allows on the patient form, et cetera. Medication error, you always want to assess the patient first. So if it says, do you want to report an incident report or tell the supervisor? It's always assess the patient first. After that, you notify whoever needs to do it and complete an incident report after that. So assess the patient, notify the correct person, and then an incident report. Okay, when it comes to incident reports, those are just a way of documenting events that poses a risk to patient. It could be a visitor, it could be employees, safety, for example, um, assaults, falls, and the like. Someone has a knee stick injury on the job, you want to wash your hands immediately and then follow your work protocol, which is usually calling supervisors, paperwork, blood work, prophylactic medication if the patient's HIV positive. So. Impaired nurse is someone who's under the influence. You always want to report it and do not hand up report to a, to a nurse who's impaired. With interpreters, you always want to maintain eye contact and translate exactly what they're saying and talk to the patient, even if there's an interpreter in the room. With advanced care planning, it's basically saying like what treatments you want. You are unable to talk for yourself and healthcare proxy is who can make that decision for you.
Then we go on to AMA against medical advice. A patient is always able to sort themselves out. You can't say you need this. You can't hold them down. That is imprisonment. But in certain conditions, they don't have the capacity to be able to make decisions on their own, like alter consciousness, under the influence, like chemical influence, and others. When it comes to a dental avulsion, so you want to rinse we answer the tooth right away, but if you can't, at least keep them moist, like in milk or something like that. If you're talking to someone who is hard of hearing, you don't want to be screaming at them. You want to just push them from the front. Maybe they can lip read, maintain eye contact with them. For eardrop, if someone's over three, you want to pull the ear up and back as opposed to under three, down and back. The British criteria list is a list of potentially harmful medications for the elderly, so if an elderly would take it, it would cause them to fall and other side effects as opposed to someone else. In the ICU, you want to maintain normal sleep-awake cycle. If you have float nurses, you want to assign them to the patients they're most familiar with, so you don't really want OB float nurses be doing med surge or med surge be doing pediatric ICU like that. You want to assign them to where they are comfortable with and you want to provide orientation for them. And if you as a float nurse don't feel comfortable, you say, I don't feel comfortable doing that. If there's a disaster scenario, there's just too many people and there's not enough resources, you want to do the most good for the most people with available resource. So unfortunately, it's not usually in medicine and everything else in the NCLEX, we're going to prioritize by who's the worst off and who can't wait. When it comes to a disaster scenario, you're doing the opposite. Not necessarily the opposite, but using the whatever resources you have for the most amount of people. So that might be taking the people who are better off than someone who's might die very soon. In terms of Jehovah's Witness, they usually don't take blood transfusion, so you want to use non-blood volume expanders, erythropoietin, IV iron, other stuff. Carbon monoxide poisoning, it displaces the hemoglobin, so the hemoglobin, so it can't bind, so it causes hypoxia. Do not go by the pulse ox because the number could show 100, but it's false. They'll have nonspecific symptoms like a headache, and it's diagnosed through a carboxyhemoglobin test. Cyanide poisoning, you'll hear something known as bitter almond smell on the patient's breath. The difference between palliative care and hospice care is a palliative, they're still doing treatment, while hospice, they're not doing treatment anymore. In terms of fall prevention, preventing falls, you want to have them exercise regularly, maintain a well-lit and cluster-free home, use night lights secure rugs, grab bars in the shower, non-skid shoes, and the like. Here is a list of labs. I'm not going through the labs because it's literally memorization. There's nothing for me. If I could you know, talk about the labs, it wouldn't help you anymore. It's literally just memorization. Here are some vitals. Here's ABG, CBC, some other labs you should know. Heart labs, bleeding labs. Here's just labs you should know. At the end, here's just six rights of drug administration, right patient, right dose, right drug, time, and documentation. And over here is how I memorize the cranial nerves. It's pretty easy. You have one nose, so that's the olfactory. You have two eyes, so we're talking about the optic. Cranial nerve, nerve number three, so Three, four, six, your eyes do tricks. So cranial nerve three, four, and six are talking about the eyes. Five rhymes with tri, so trigeminal. Seven, I like to think about it if it's perfectly in a face, so it's a facial nerve. Eight, it looks like a twisted ear, so that's why I like to think of it that way. It's the, um, the acoustics, the ear. Nine, so G is for gag reflex, and if you turn G around, it looks like a nine, so it's the glossopharyngeal. 10, I like to think of like everyone would give Las Vegas a 10 out of 10, so the vagus nerve. And 11, you could just put one on one on each shoulder, and so that's why the spinal accessories, the shoulders. And the last cranial nerve is number 12. Sounds a little far fetched, but what I like to think about, I think about like a 12 year old teenager giving attitude, chewing gum. So chewing gum would be hypoglossal. So that's pretty much it. Thank you very much for watching. This is really a review. So if you want to know this more in depth, check out my videos. If you have any question, put it in the comment section below or send me an email. And thank you for watching. Good luck.